<laughs> okay, here we are, a metal talk, and it gives me great pleasure I'm talking to Joe Payne, the new shining light of the Enid. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Joe, it's good to meet you. How are you? I'm very well, I'm very well. Yeah, looking forward to a uh, quite big week this week, Robert's last show and everything. Of course, because it is a big week. Friday the 1st, the album Dust comes out. I've got the album right there. There it is, people. And uh, also a big show, like you mentioned, Robert's last show yeah. at the Cadogan Hall in London. Mm -hmm. So is it a nervous week for you or an exciting week? I think, um, in a way, the focus is taken off me mm. for a change, which is, which is actually quite relaxing because uh, I think for any front man, they do tend to get quite nervous yeah. before a show. Um, I don't tend to get too nervous in the build-up to these things though, it's just, just before we go on stage, yeah. that'll be when, it, when I start getting sweats and things. <laughs> just describe that feeling when you are about to walk on stage, you know, do, do you get like, you know, is it butterflies in the stomach? Um, I think, uh, how would be best to describe it? Sometimes you just think, I really need a shit. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's not that at all, you, yeah. it's just butterflies in your stomach, like yeah, you say. Yeah. And um, it, it happens less so now, uh, and sometimes I won't feel nervous until I finally got on stage and looked someone in the audience in the eye. Uh -huh. And that's when I go, oh damn, I'm having to, uh, I'm having to really work to impress these people. Yeah. Uh, and, and the nerves usually come from the way that the audience will look at you. So mm -hmm. in our shows, Certainly the ones we've been doing recently, they tend to be in theatres and being seated venues, it creates a kind of formality and a full form yeah. when you're doing the show. Um, and so you look out to the audience and uh, you know that they're probably feeling a lot of emotions listening to it, they're taking in all the detail and actually they might be pulling quite a blank expression but that's because they're concentrating, that's because they're yeah. focused yeah. on what you're doing. Um, and you do wonder, as the artist sometimes, are they actually enjoying themselves or not? And then, being progressive music, sometimes you have to wait about 20 minutes mm. before you find out whether or not they're enjoying <laughs> yeah. it or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Because like the, the music of the Enid, you, you are a very unique band, and it is, a, it is a music where you do have to listen. And obviously, um, crowds must vary when you play like a festival. Mm -hmm compared to like, a, like you say, a theatre, where everyone are sitting and listening politely. So what's the difference between playing a festival and say a, a grand theatre? Well, it's strange, because it kind of depends on the festival. I mean, we've had some festivals where we uh, walk away from them and, and people kind of say, oh, you were the highlight of the festival. Mm. Um, but then we've had other festivals where people have kind of responded with, I don't really know what you were doing here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so it can. I think even have had the whole time, can we? <laughs> so, so doing our own shows, um, which I mean, we act as our own promoter for yeah. most of the shows mm. we do, especially in the UK, and uh, we know from that that people are coming because they want mm. to come, and there's no kind of uh, the fact that we're not sharing bills very often, um, kind of you know, even though you might feel a bit um, out of your comfort zone mm. when you're on the stage ultimately people have come to see you and you know that and that's uh, that gives you kind of some security in, in the confidence you have when you're doing the show. Mm -hmm. So uh, but yeah festivals I do always wonder uh, especially as we're so different to a lot of the other progressive rock bands mm. that people come to see um, a lot of people at festivals might be experiencing us for the first time so that's so that's always something to bear in mind so Whereas we can take a lot of risks when we're doing our own show, uh, sometimes you've got to think, right, we are really creating a first impression this time. Um, we need to make sure that first impression is absolutely right. And, Good. Uh, you've got to think very, very, very <laughs> carefully about what, what steps you take when, you, when you're yeah. thinking about that. And uh, let's talk about the album Dust. It's sort of like um, the last part in a trilogy, of a Journey's End and Victor and now Dust. How pleased are you with the album? I think it's uh, an album that's far truer to the um, to the kind of content that uh, myself, Max Reed, and Jason Ducker are interested in putting out. I think um, 
it kind of sings the uh, sings the message that we are going in the direction that we want to go in now. Mm-hmm. And uh, with Journey's End and Invicta, I feel like the thing that strings these albums together, as well as the content kind of bringing themes back, etc. Um, the thing that strings these albums together is that it's kind of like Journey's End was was the uh, conception of this new era. It was it was the uh, very beginning. It was the journey from from the Enid's womb of this new generation of people uh, that were providing content. Um, and then in Victor, it's kind of like it's kind of like that album's all about the nurture because because it is all about the shepherd and the flock and and the wolves that circle it and and the dangers they create and and that's kind of the the nurture process in a way and I certainly feel that uh, as my first project with the Union, um I had a lot to learn and I was quite naive when when we did that so that kind of makes dust feel like it's a coming of age for the rest of us because Robert has taken quite a large step back really mm-hmm. in the writing process and uh, these songs really feel like they're my songs and Max's songs and Jason's songs um, and Robert has collaborated with us as an equal mm-hmm. rather than perhaps in the past having a much bigger influence on the direction of the music than he has this time. So, um, yeah, I feel really proud of everyone involved in it because it really does feel like the band's work. And it is quite rare for like new members to join a band with someone like, say, Robert, who's been in the band for 40 years, you know, and uh, the only original member left. And uh, So how much sort of leeway, how much encouragement did he give you to say it was your band too? Robert's always given me a huge amount of encouragement because I think he's always seen um, that if this band was going to have a future mm. that he needed to have that attitude and he's had the same um, he's had the same attitude with Max and Jason and now Zachary Bullock as well who's mm. joining him on keyboards and uh, has a lot of incredible ideas yeah. which we're going to be moving forward with for the next albums that we do because um, he's a great talent blows my mind actually mm. And uh, yeah, I think if there's any kind of, if there's any, ever been any kind of pressure on me or negative feeling um, about what I'm capable of or what, uh, or about the, um, about the ability uh, that I might have potential to bring out in this band, uh, it's not come from Robert at all. Mm. Um, and it's not come from anyone on the inside, there, there's just been some doubt over the years from people that have followed the band for years and perhaps seen Robert as the the only safety net that this band has. And so I completely understand that. I would say that um, some of those some of those attitudes that I've uh, that I've had the displeasure of reading or hearing or sometimes even to my face people saying um, did give me a bit of a complex um, something that I really had to get over for I really had to get over that with this album um, because it kind of dragged me down Mm. a lot and made me feel really doubt myself as an artist and really question um, whether or not I was proud to be the kind of artist that I that I know I am Mm. Uh, and uh, that is why this album t- has taken so long, mm. because we've uh, we've had so much doubt, we've had so much uh, frustration, um, and uh, been worried about trying to please people that will never be happy. Uh, but at the same time, knowing that ultimately, unless we can be happy with what we're doing ourselves, uh, then the whole thing is pointless. Like, wh- why, why do it? If, yeah. you're, if you're the artist, you should be allowed to be the artist. And so, uh, yeah, getting over that um, has take, it took a couple of years to, that's why we did um, The Bridge as an interim album, because I felt uh, it was an absolutely essential step 
that we do another project leading up to dust in order for me to exercise some discipline in uh, developing my skills and uh, and uh, developing the kind of the kind of character that I was going to be for the future and uh, that was really valuable that was a really valuable step and now you're feeling fully confident I hope I think so I think you know I've, I've come come to this stage now feeling like you know what people can take me or leave mm. me and uh, I think that's uh, the way that the Enid has always yeah, yeah, yeah. had to Certainly, be yeah. and uh, I think if you were any other admired artist, they've had to think in exactly that yeah, way yeah. as well. And uh, I think it's, it can be a shame when people, um, people who have supported this band for decades feel like you having that attitude um, about your own artistic freedom is like you're, is like you're devaluing the uh, amount of um, support they've given you, like because they might not agree with what you're doing, yeah. they feel that you're kind of um, doing them an injustice by maybe not doing what they want yeah. them to do. But I think those kind of people are now in the minority. Most people have come around to the idea yeah. that actually what we're doing is right for us and they still love it and they still want to support it and whatever worries they had in the past. <laughs> um, for a lot of these people are now settled and they feel comfortable with it. Well, if there's anything I ever hear when I'm at, like, recently at <laughs> uh, Perfelli, the Hard Rock uh, Hell Pog Festival, and Cambridge Rock Festival in the past, and even your own gigs, I always overhear people on the way out, and they always say, that singer, he's something special, so... <laughs> I don't think you've got too much to worry about. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, let's talk about the lyrical content on uh, Dust, and um, mm. it's a bit more political. Yeah, so, I mean... On some level, Invicta was quite a political album, hmm. uh, but it was more, it was more um, socially aware than political. Hmm. Um, I mean, I come from, or I grew up in, a very conservative environment. Um, and then when I met the band, I moved to Northampton and suddenly found myself in the company of some very liberal people, some very left-wing people, um, and it really challenged my way of thinking uh, and, and has allowed me to be far more, um, not cynical, uh, but certainly, um, what's the word? What's the word? Oh, my brain does aware? this sometimes. Aware? Um, Socially aware? Skeptical. Oh, skept oh, yeah. Skeptical, I would say, is probably what <laughs> I'm after. Uh, become much more skeptical about the world around us. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, I think that's been quite powerful uh, for the work we've done with the Enid because before the Enid, I'd never written songs that had any kind of political angle whatsoever. And so Invicta was, uh, it was quite naively written, but I had a perfect, I had a perfect platform to begin. Yeah because um, we were surrounded by the Olympics at the time. So the Olympics, the 2012 Olympics were taking place here in London. And uh, I saw a complete change in our society as a result of it. We mm. were very, very, went from being very individualistic to being very collective. And I'd never experienced that before. And uh, people were really proud of their country. And I'd never seen that before either. <laughs> and so it was, it was quite, quite remarkable. So um, that largely is actually what uh, inspired a lot of the lyrical content from Victor. But then with Dust, um, a lot of it came together during the last uh, elections. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it was a very dirty election campaign. Mm. A lot As of, I always are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I mean, Again, kind of the coming of age, uh, it really speaks for itself yeah. here because uh, how much notice was I ever playing before? Yeah. I think it was an, an interesting way you put the lyrics together for A Thousand Stars. Mm -hmm. You sort of particularly sort of um, chopped bits and pieces of what uh, politicians said and put them together. Is that yeah, correct? so if you were to go on YouTube now <laughs> and search 
Jeremy Paxman interviews with David Cameron, Ed Miliband, and Nigel Farage, uh, you will hear quite a lot of uh, snippets mm. that reappear in <laughs> 1000 Stars. And uh, also at the time I was uh, very fascinated by, because if, if, if you were more on the left or if you were a Labour supporter, uh, you might have noticed that a lot of uh, a lot of celebrities were kind of coming out the woodwork, going, the coverage of this election isn't balanced. Listen to us. Mm. We uh, we are the people that have access to the media, and we're telling you, vote Labour. Um, and they are the one thousand stars <laughs> that are that are saying, you know, we've got your best interests at heart. Um, you can't trust the media coverage because it's mm. not, uh, it's not actually, it's capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's funded by capitalism. It can't possibly be balanced. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so yeah, all of those things together created the lyrical content for A Thousand Stars. And, um, and I really do feel like because the media can't be balanced, it is a little bit like we're being raped intellectually by what we hear and see and read. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's why in the show, mm -hmm. you see me humping a ramp <laughs> and ejaculating stars <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, decaying animals yeah. being eaten to death by maggots <laughs> and things, you know. That's, you know, it sums it up for me. Because uh, if, if you can't laugh at it and you can't see the, 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 the dark humour in it, mm. Definitely. Then how are we going to cope with it? You know? <laughs> and uh, we must talk about Robert, you know, because um, big, lavish, outspoken gentleman. And uh, what's he like to work with? Robert and I uh, have a lot of similarities in our personalities, which uh, can cause the occasional clash. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, we're actually always aiming for the same thing. Um, we just have a funny way of. Uh, of trying to get our points across, which yeah. can occasionally, uh, but that, you know that's that's what it's like. If you're an artist, chances are you have a very strong mind. Um, you're some you're going to be someone that has a vision for what you want to do, um, and push for that as much as possible, um, because you really believe in in the message you want to give uh -huh. and the way you wish for it to be presented. Um, so he and I, you know are both very similar in that sense and I can say that we're always 100% happy with the end result once we reach it um, and uh, I, can, I don't think there can be any other uh, any other joining of minds like mm. the connection that Robert and I have when we're writing together um, just because I haven't seen it before I haven't seen um, anyone producing stuff like what Robert and I are producing before that's come from two places, sometimes three or four places because Max and Jason as well mm. have had a huge amount of uh, a huge amount of say in, in this work um, and I think they have far more experience than I do working with Robert <laughs> um, and I would, I would definitely say everyone everyone has a place in this band that, mm, yeah, that, yeah. that is right for them. And how does the writing process come together, you know, because it's quite classical music, you know, so as mm. putting the lyrics to that style of music, but it can't be easy. Well, often for me, the, the melody and the lyrics come together. Mm -hmm. So certainly the majority of the melodic material came from me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and that is always good, because it gives, always gives me a starting point. Um, the hooks, that will come tend to be quite elusive, and therefore um, I can, when I, as we're building the song, I can I can adapt the context um, from that elusive hook. Uh, so that that's quite convenient, really. Um, and and again, like Robert and I have quite a similar way of thinking, and and therefore whatever whatever um, whatever we're constructing. The piece of work around um, 
means that we are kind of directing each other towards towards um, articles and and uh, theories and and mythology sometimes mm. you know that where we're going right okay that's that's kind of where I'm coming from with this uh, and uh, you know we're constantly feeding each other feeding each other's minds mm. so um, so yeah I it, it does it, I don't find writing lyrics as hard as people might think I do uh -huh. um, but it certainly helps if you've had played quite a big role in the writing as well yeah, definitely yeah and uh, sadly Robert is retiring from the live scene of the Enid mm -hmm. it's still going to be held very much in the background but how, uh, sort of how confident are you going up on stage without Robert in the future like you've got two shows coming up in Japan very confident um, the two shows in Japan will feature Robert I oh, will, of course, uh, because yeah, yes. they they booked us a long time ago, yeah. and it's all part of the contract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Robert's never been to Japan before, yeah. and I know he, he's absolutely. Yeah, because I don't think the Indians have ever played there, have they? No, we never have. Yeah. Um, so, Robert's very confident in us. Yeah. I'm very confident in us as well. Um, I certainly know what we're capable of, and what Zachary uh, is capable of on on the keys. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was. Um, I was in the office doing lots of administration work, so I usually am. Um, and this is only a few days ago, and our rehearsal room is next door. And uh, the door had been left open, and I could hear someone um, tinkering around on the piano. And this had been going on for quite a while, and probably about half an hour's worth. And the whole time I thought it was Robert playing. Yeah. And then Something was played where I thought, well, no, Robert would never play something like that. And I realised it was Zach. And I and I thought, assumed because of because of the quality of what was being played that it yeah, was yeah. it was Robert that whole time. No, it was Zach. And I that was, here. that was quite a quite a turning point moment where I mm -hmm. just thought, wow, no, we are. Uh, we are in safe hands here. This, this guy knows what he's doing. And what, what would you like to see for the future of the Enid? Um, I would like to see the Enid getting um, getting more credit from the rest of the music industry because mm. I, th I feel that um, I feel that a lot of what Robert's achieved over the decades has been gone largely unnoticed and largely mm. underrated. Um, I think we have an opportunity now that's unique to the Enid. Like, how many bands can actually rebrand themselves mm. in the way that we have uh, and reface themselves, um, uh, almost as if it's like a, a fresh start, but with a legacy? Mm. How many bands can say they yeah, exactly. they've done that? How many bands can say they can do that? And uh, that that's another unique thing for the Enid. And I think we have a perfect opportunity here to actually retain our credibility but have all the more accessibility at the same time and, and ultimately make something progressive more commercial again and all we need is um, the support of everyone around us and, uh, and, and we could do that, we really could. Also the majority of the band are young guys so you've got years ahead of you still. So. Yeah well I'm, I'm uh, thinking you know like Swimwear calendars. And <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, get down to the gym, do some more sit-ups. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have shot a video for um, shot someone shall rise. Oh, where, where was that filmed? That was filmed at the um, Holy Sepulchre in Northampton. I think it's only one of two buildings like it in the UK. Okay. Actually, it's a really rare uh, style of architecture. Um, and it's literally just around the corner from where we live. Fantastic. Which is, um, and I, I've never been inside. Yeah. Um, and the guy that we hired to film the video for us recommended that church um, as as a as a potentially yeah. uh, beautiful location to do the video. Um, and of course, that as a setting is the perfect place to do someone a someone shall rise video. Because it's all about, it's all about 
well, Summer Shall Rise itself isn't all about Jesus, but it could be um, if that's the meaning that you wanted to find in it. Because, it, it, you know, it's just another elusive song. It mm. could be about anyone rising. I mean, you know, it could be about someone really bad coming to power. <laughs> you know, it could be about anything. Um, but, you know, we were releasing this around Easter time. And uh, if you wanted it to be about Jesus, then, you know, this that church is all about his... Um, his rebirth it's all about the phoenix, phoenix rising from the ashes so you know perfect setting well look, joe it's been wonderful talking to you we could Lovely talk all day we really too. could <laughs> uh, the album dust out on friday the first of april and That's go right. get it and uh, i wish you all the best for the future thanks so I much it's gonna be very interesting <laughs> thank you thank you